Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this evening's very exciting event. Thank you so much for joining us for the first 2023 installment of TCU Presents. As you know, this year is TCU's 150th. We are looking back and we're looking forward, celebrating who we are, who we were, who we are, and who we are becoming. First, TCU acknowledges the many benefits, responsibilities, and relationships of being in this place, which we share with all living beings. We respectfully acknowledge all Native American peoples who have lived on this land since time memorial. TCU especially acknowledges and pays respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose historical homeland our university is located. History is an evolving understanding. While TCU knows its own history, as a community, we have much more to learn. In 2020, the university launched the Race and Reconciliation Initiative to better understand its relationship with slavery, racism, and the Confederacy. I would like to thank the TCU Alumni Association, TCU Magazine, and the Office of Social Media Management for inviting us to share our work in this special session of TCU Presents. My name is Amiso George. I am an accredited public relations practitioner, and I'm a fellow of the Public Relations Society of America College of Fellows. I am a full professor and former chair of strategic communication and strategic communication department here at TCU. I was also a Fulbright scholar at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And I was the 2017 PRSA Educator of the Year. I am an avid researcher specifically in the area of crisis communication. And I've been director of the public relations program at the University of Nevada in Reno, as well as visiting professor at Swinburne University in Australia. I've worked as a crisis consultant in the United States and different countries in Asia and Africa. And I've been quoted extensively on crisis communication cases in the media. And I'm co-editor of two books about crisis communication and another one on race, gender, and media. I am the current chair of the Race and Reconciliation Initiative, a group of TCU faculty, staff, students, and alumni who are researching and raising awareness about racism and inequality in our environment, and thus helping us to walk towards a campus culture where everyone is respected and valued. Today, we will discuss a major product from the first years of the initiative, that is the Oral History Project. Reading through TCU archives is illuminating but hearing these personal stories out loud makes history come alive, as you will see in the summary video. TCU integrated its main campus in 1964. The unanimous vote by the Student Congress to send to the trustees that we need to racially integrate now. 56 years later, students still voice their concerns regarding racial discrimination on campus. The Oral History Project is a new way to interpret and understand TCU's rich and complex history. Most of what we know of the African American experience is told through white voices. Then what does that say about the people who actually had the experience? There is another side to every story. I emailed him one day and said, if you're really serious about what you're saying, we need to have a meeting. 2016 marked a shift as students expressed growing frustrations over the lack of Black representation. Well, like, this is a little weird. I, I wasn't used to that in my classes. And it occurred to me that every time a Black student probably walked into a room, that's how they felt at TCU. Like, they were usually the only person that looked like them. I was like, hmm, I want to shake things up. And if it comes down to it, I would get arrested, like, for the cause. Though TCU has publicly promoted diversity, we still have a long way to go. 
And so what I'm trying to do is set a tone. And my tone on this whole race thing is that there's room at the table for everybody. In 2000, being 4% Black and 84% Caucasian, TCU did not meet the 17% minority quota for diversity. And I think for African American students, it was 200, maybe 200 plus. So it was small enough to where we knew everyone. In 1990, thanks to the tireless efforts of Michelle Smith, Dr. Linda Moore, and student athletes, TCU adopted Martin Luther King's Day as a campus wide holiday. The, the athletes knew it, they know it. They're not blind. In 1980, TCU's first, though short-lived, interracial fraternity, Tai Chi Epsilon, was born. Relived the inception of black student activism. Discover success stories like Dr. Jennifer Giddings Brooks, first black this TCU, and Dr. James Cash, first black TCU student athlete. Uh, that it would be fitting to erect a statue of Dr. Cash in front of Schulmeyer Arena. That... Uncover mysteries. So seeing how these students left, never to return, what we're asking is, what happened to them? And what possibly could make them not want to ever return? They just decided they were gonna do this and brought five black kids on campus. Um, the atmosphere was not welcoming was not welcoming. Understand the cause of integration is the story of Dr. Ron Hurdle, first black cheerleader at TCU. You know, Ronnie was treated so poorly. I look back on this. Hmm. You know, we, we never thought of anything like this. We, we were just trying to do what we thought we should do. And you hit it on the head that, you know, now is the time for everybody to do what they can where they are. And get the whole untold, unmuted story. So who then would counter uh, something that was, you know, democratically established? Uh, who are they? Because we always say they did. <laughs> it, it was... Uh, it was time to reconcile that. We need to retrace our steps. Stay tuned. spoken to more than 30 and counting TC constituents who have shared their experiences from the early days of campus integration in the 1960s through today when the calls for change are ongoing. Joining me today is Dr. Sylvianne Brinswood. She holds a PhD in geography and anthropology from Louisiana State University. She is presently a postdoctoral fellow with the Race and Reconciliation Initiative and she leads the oral history project and supervises archival research. As she says, in the case of TCU, we have so many different shades of purple and white, and they all deserve to be put out there. Dr. Green's word anthropological work has been centered on the performance of racial and ethnic identity in the African diaspora with a special focus on black hair. She has conducted extensive ethnographic research with hair braiders and hair salon owners in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, New York City, Austin, Texas, as well as in Kingston, Ocho Rios, and Kitson Town in Jamaica. She's published several French to English translations of Francophone African literature manuscripts. She is co-author of the much anticipated book, A History to Remember, TCU in Purple, White, and black. Sylvian, welcome. Hey, good evening. Also joining me is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., aka Dr. G, who holds a PhD from Georgetown University. He's an associate professor, history professor, and the Dr. Ronald E. Moore Endowed 
professor of the humanities at TCU. Featured in national publications such as New York Times, Time Magazine, and USA Today, Dr. Gooding critically analyzes image with the images rather within mainstream culture and engages audiences on racial patterns hidden in plain sight. Dr. G, as we all call him, has also provided social commentary on CBS, NBC, and Fox News networks, and served as inaugural chair of TCU's Race and Reconciliation Initiative. He's also co-author of A History to Remember, TCU in Purple, White, and Black, which is due for release this April, and hopefully in time for Reconciliation Day. Dr. Gu, Thank you for having me. All right. So what do you have? Questions, a few questions. What do you hope the Race and Reconciliation Initiative will accomplish for you? Um, Dr. Greensward, you want to start with that? So, you know, reconciliation is um, a constant. It's an ideal. It's kind of a a utopia, if you want. Um, but I do believe that working toward that process is, is what we're here for. So, what I hope uh, that the RI will accomplish for TCU is, first of all, to raise an awareness that reconciliation is needed, um, and then to shed light on the reasons why reconciliation is needed to, um, you know, elevate those stories that have not necessarily been heard in the past. To um, shed light on the truth, as simple as that. You know, there's a saying that says, um, for reconciliation, there's for the truth. So I think, you know, um, I would just like to add on to that response by stating that I'm just saying anything else. Uh, after all, has anyone heard? I believe we have a sizable and for two, two hours on our campus. Has anyone heard about the size that gets? If you take a tour, it's about like roughly $900,000, right? It's beautified a campus. Um, you know, a lot of people love talking about it and, and it adds to the aesthetic. But at the same time, you don't plant the flowers once. I mean, there's this continual maintenance that's also included, or you know, that's just part of the plan. And so, I think uh, what we hope to accomplish is this idea that um, we just want to create a space and place where we're constantly making space and place to talk about it. Uh, for us, it wasn't a matter of coming up with a solution. Um, you know, the idea is that these issues are complicated; they've been going on for a very long time, and so it might take us some time to resolve them. But the fact that we're making a dedicated effort. And just like we have maintenance on our tulips, and maintenance on our flowers, the idea that we want to have continual maintenance on how we can improve as a community, I think is in the same vein. So, so why is an accurate, holistic uh, account of the university so vital uh, to our future? Well, I mean, the, the population that we have right now um, unfortunately is not necessarily aware of where we came from. Um, it's one thing to be proud to be a horn frog. It's one thing to be proud to have graduated from TCU when to be a student at TCU. But it's another thing to actually be aware of what had to happen in order for TCU to become the flagship university that it is today. So I believe that unless we learn from the past, we cannot possibly embrace the future to the extent that we should. Dr. G? This is terrible. I keep going behind this eloquence. Um, so I'll just try to add on to that and state the truth is the foundation for trust. I mean, think about any of us who goes to our local uh, Walmart or Sprouts and buys some milk, right? If you purchase some almond milk and open it and chocolate milk comes out, there's a problem. Why? Because what was represented to you is not what you're receiving. It's a problem, right? Now, again, not to say that you don't like almond milk or your chocolate milk, but the idea is that if somebody represents something to you and you receive something different, it's a problem. So why not take advantage? And as Dr. Greensward eloquently said, rather than erase the truth, embrace it. So that way we just simply know what we're dealing with. 
And what that means, that's for us to determine. But the truth is the foundation of trust. And I believe if we're going to have a lifelong relationship, think about how so many students who graduate will have a lifelong relationship with this institution. I think building that foundation with trust is a good way to start that relationship. Thank you. And Dr. G, this question is directed at you. <laughs> yes. Um, what were some of the major uh, moments from the first year of the RRI? Because you were the um, founding chair. So That, Dr. George, is a tough question. There's just so much to choose from. Um, but honestly, what I would say right now is that I think the process itself of coming together so we can move forward together is what resonates with me still. When I think about our core team of Dr. Karen Still, Dr. Sylvain Greensward, and as you all know, if he hasn't been mentioned before, the marvelous Mr. Perkins, along with Amy Seneceros, we had that core team. And from there, we branched out. We were able to work with many students in the history department, interns from Mr. Will to, to others, to um, our colleagues at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to try to institutionalize some of these ideas. So Aisha Tori Sawyer played a role, Dr. Flo still playing a role, to upper administration. I mean, the work we did could not have been done without the support of our dear provost and our uh, Teresa Dahlberg and our chancellor, uh, uh, Victor Bersini. Um, you know, not to mention even from the way top, right, or the board of trustees, uh, Mark Johnson, right? So all that buy-in, I think, was important to our team members with the marketing communication, um, you know, being able to communicate effectively what we were doing was key. And so we're very thankful to Vice Chancellor uh, uh, Tracy Tyler jones and Holly Elman and others. But, I mean, whether it be from Greek life to, you know, BSA to going out in the community uh, with Black Coffee, it was the process of connecting that I think is what really encourages me still because this is something that we can always do and it's available to us, it's always an option and, it's, it's, and, it, and what excites me is this idea that we can continue to build upon these connections. What's, what did you learn about TCU that surprised you the first few years? What did you learn about TCU that surprised you? Is it directed to both of us? Sorry, or? sorry, directed to Dr. G, sorry, oh, I should have okay. You mentioned that, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to make sure um, you know we share a spotlight um, because what we really need to hear about is how this oral history project got started. But yeah. that being said, I think what really surprised me is this idea that I learned that most of us are good people. I mean, after all, we do have to account for Dallas Cowboy fans, <clears throat> but most of us are good people. But what I learned is that many of us are limited by what I call the three E's, right? We're limited in terms of experience, exposure, and education. So it's not to excuse or exonerate shortcomings or uh, areas of growth that still need to be addressed. But this idea that um, many people want to move in the right direction and simply are looking for the right outlets in that right context, I think that's where... Um, you know, I, I was surprised because oftentimes when trying to effectuate change, um, you know, assumptions are made on, on both sides, right? You know, and uh, again, the, you know, the university has earned this reputation for, for in certain respects in terms of, you know, change in that respect. But when we actually engaged in the process of reconciliation, we found that we had uh, a lot more willing partners than maybe what we uh, had presumed at first. But at the same time, you know, we're still on the hunt for more. Okay, and this question is also for you, Dr. G. Um, it's the Oral History Project. We know it's your idea originally. What did you have in mind when you launched it? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that um, I had no idea it was going to uh, develop to the level of magnificence and brilliance that, that it is now, right? You know, but, but we knew, and, and I knew, you know, at the core that, um, oral history. I mean, after all, um, you know, even though we we're talking about a different time period, what's I, I fascinating is when you talk about enslavement, most of what we know about enslavement, ironically, is not through the voices of those who were actually victimized and enslaved, right? It's, it's through the diaries or the court records of, you know, of the people in society who were thinking that they could actually purchase and own other people, i.e. my white brothers and sisters. That being said, um, we did not want to make that same mistake. Here in the year, you know, where we are right now, we still have living contact and connections to these areas in the past. And so the idea was to capture their stories. 
And so uh, this is where Dr. Green's word and anthropological background came on in and not only made these connections, but also uncovered and discovered connections that went beyond anything that we had imagined. And I think the university will be forever changed as a result. And I'm making a reference to uh, Charlie Thorpe, Kate and Charlie Thorpe. Okay, thank you. Dr. Greenswood, what did you hope to learn through the oral history project? Honestly, I didn't, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I didn't have any high hopes in the sense that I was a newcomer to Texas when I was hired for this job. Um, I was a couple of years out of grad school and I had done oral history before and I had done ethnography and uh, I got hired because of those qualifications. So I came here to do a job. Um, I did not know that I would bond with the people uh, whom I interviewed. Uh, I did not know that my involvement would be so personal. And um, honestly, I did not know that after hearing the stories, I would really feel like I am a horn frog. It's kind of hard to be attached to an institution when you're hired to figure out what's wrong with it. So my hopes were not that high, honestly. Um, but I've learned that history is, um, derived through the action of human beings. And because they're human beings, I don't have a choice but to love them. And that job of loving them and knowing them, getting to know them, um, it supersedes my responsibilities as a scientist. So, you know, this is there's a contrast between what I hoped and, and what eventually happened. And so basically you've also answered the, the, the follow-up question that I was going to ask, what surprised you mm. as you, as you did this project? So you, you had no idea you would become so involved and really develop this personal relationship. So you've, you've basically answered my second question. Okay. And, and that's really fascinating for us to know. And it's important also that we share with you, uh, our audience, viewing audience from wherever you are, that the interviews actually started with Emily Laugh, who you may have seen in the earlier video. And Emily, who graduated in 2016, uh, was a student. She was key, in fact, in the student movement that led to the recent TCU developments, including the establishment of the African-American and Africana Studies and Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies major, and now the new Intercultural Center TCU. It's important to note, if you didn't observe uh, in that short clip, that Emily is white. And Emily's story really got us thinking about the power of allies to advance change at the university or anywhere for that matter. And Emily's story of being an ally, of being such a, an advocate and a very important one leads us to, it becomes a very perfect segue to introduce our a first alumni guest. And I should also, I will tell you about this alumni guest. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for some, some unforeseen reason, he's not able to join us, but it's important that we hear his story, okay? And our first alumni guest who couldn't join us today uh, for, some, for some unforeseen reason is Mark Wasenick, 64, graduate. Dr. Mark Wasenick was a student body president at TCU. He graduated in 1964 with a bachelor's degree in geography and after service as an officer in the US Air Force from the University of North Carolina with a master's degree in city and regional planning in 1970, Mark's career focused on older neighborhood rehabilitation, low income housing and state and federal grant management. At the city of Dallas, he was chief community development assistant and he became budget, assistant budget director and assistant director of housing and urban rehabilitation. At the US Treasury Department, he was an affordable housing specialist for South Central Region. And he was a principal at Startman Wassenich Associates. Since 1999, the Wassenich Award for mentoring in the TCU community has honored those 
who serve as role models, advisors, and guides for students at TCU. Mark and his wife, Linda, were the recipients of the TCU 2003 Valuable Alumni Award. He is founding chair of the John V. Roach Honors College Board of Visitors and chair of the Clark Society. And he received an honorary doctorate degree from TCU in 2019. As I said earlier, Mark couldn't join us today, but it's very important that you know about him and know about his contributions to this university and also know about his contributions to the theme of our event this evening. So now I'm going to um, essentially turn um, the attention, turn this over to uh, Dr. Sylvian. Um, and Dr. Sylvian, you are going to take over right now. And in the meantime, we want to urge our viewers from wherever they are, please type your questions or leave your comments. We are going to read them and we will try to respond to them as quickly as possible and as comprehensively as possible. Okay. Okay. Given that um, we are not able to have Mark with us, we are going to have, and you've just heard about had me read his history, which is absolutely important um, for us and for all of our viewers, wherever they are. We would now introduce our second guest, our alumni, L. Michelle Smith. And I would tell you a little bit about L. Michelle Smith before I hand this over to, um, um, for her to be interviewed or, or for us to have what we will call a heightened conversation with her, right? It's not an interview per se. L. Michelle Smith has two degrees from TCU, so she's a double graduate. She is the CEO and founder of No Silos Communication. It is a media and consulting company that blends talent development and strategic communication to develop high-performing executive leaders with a specialty in women and women of color. She's an executive and personal coach at her private practice, NSC Coaching. And she's a go-to executive coach for the Executive Leadership Council. Elle Michelle is the author of the award-winning and best-selling book, No Thanks, Seven Ways to Say, I'll Just Include Myself, a guide to rock star leadership for women of color in the workplace. She is also a creator, executive producer, and host of the Culture Soup podcast. Say hello, Michelle. Thank you so much, Dr. George, and the other two Dr. Gs. And I would hand it over to, to both of them, to starting with Dr. Greensward, to um, have begin this heightened conversation with you. Dr. Greensward. Thank you. El Michelle Smith, nice to see you again. Dr. Greensword, it's so Looking good to see you. Looking fabulous as always. Well, thank you. I didn't look very fabulous that day that I spoke to you because I ran across campus after uh, lecturing in my senior seminar class. and But I was so excited to sit with you. And it was a very moving interview indeed. So for our audience, if you were to summarize um, can it even be summarized? But how would you summarize your description of campus culture in the 1990s? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to be such a part of this moving and important work. And I applaud each and every one of you for doing it. So life in the 90s was interesting because I look at the cultural context and one of the things that was influencing black students during that time was a show called A Different World. And it may seem a little bit odd that I would bring this up, but we were influenced by it. In fact, everyone on campus stopped everything on Thursday nights. There were no club meetings, nothing to watch Cosby in a Different World. I say that because during that time, the actors were wearing t-shirts like Free South Africa 
or you would see them actually address address race and other topics on the show. And it really was inspiring to us. And there were some other things going on in other parts of the country, like in Atlanta, where there was a man that was dragged. And we had friends at Morehouse and Spelman who had hit the streets and protested. And we were looking at what we could do right here at TCU, even though there were 3% of us <laughs> on campus to make a change. And one thing that I did during that time was actually write for the SCIF. I had a, a column that it was it was published every Thursday. And during that time frame, I would talk about race and it was touchy. I had very, very supportive faculty. That's for sure. That were very vocal. And many of the students were supportive, but the most vocal ones were not. So it was tense in some ways. In other ways, it was not. It felt like family. But because there were just three percent of us compared to the rest of the population, and you had some segregation going on when it came to the athletes who had a totally different schedule and such. The football team had to be at the training table at dinner. They couldn't eat with us. We felt isolated in some cases. So um, we had good family relationships with one another, but there weren't a lot of us. So when we did speak up, it was it was shocking to some. But, you know, just to build upon that, and by the way, it's good to see you, right? Um, good to see you too. Absolutely. But why, though? What, what, why did you continue to speak up despite the fact that on paper, you're outnumbered, you're isolated? Because what's so fascinating is p teaching at a predominantly white institution, um, I'll have classes that are mostly white students, mm -hmm. and they'll tell me that they're reluctant to participate because they're, quote, afraid to say the wrong thing, right? right? And here they are part of the quote unquote majority, right? Right. So what, what do you think factored for this fortitude or temerity of, of, of character, the strength to be able to speak up on a consistent basis about something that maybe wasn't as popular then as it maybe it is now? I think several of us just didn't know any better. <laughs> we didn't know to be afraid. And just me personally, you know, when I was four years old, my parents quoted a scripture to me and, and I always remembered it. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. me. So if something needed to be said, I was going to say it. And if I got backlash, well, everybody's not going to like what you have to say. But I would say that it was interesting coming from a high school that was almost the flip, the opposite of TCU. I went to a tiny Christian academy called Tyler Street Christian Academy which was very black, brown, white, Asian. It was everybody. And we say to this day, we were doing diversity before diversity was even a word. Mm -hmm. And we had interracial couples. Nobody blinked an eye going down the, the halls. And, you know, people were hand in hand. We were, we were a family. So to come to TCU was, it was a little bit shocking to me to hear some of the boldness that some people had in, having a problem with people who didn't look like them. So I think my reaction was, it was um, probably just an instinct, mm -hmm. you know, it was m my first reaction and I, I, they gave me a pen and they allowed me to write for the skiff. So I wrote about it. You know, when you talk about different people and their reactions, I mean, we take it for granted now, um, but Dr. Martin Luther King holiday, yes. right. You know, is a, uh, you know, equivalent to Christmas almost, uh, yes. you know, you can look up sales and, you know, just, it's a good time. And everyone reminisces about this, this man, but a lot of people kind of forget what made him famous, this idea that he was advocating against something. Absolutely. Right. And so um, speaking of which you played a role, did you not in terms of, uh, you know, that holiday being recognized, can you walk us through the, the ups and downs and, and sure. what you had to perhaps, uh, fight against or reconcile. Sure. Back when I was on campus, the Black Student Association was called a Black Student Caucus. And there were so few of us that the president of the Gospel Word of Truth, which was the choir, I was a part of that too, was also the president of Black Student Caucus at the time, Shonda Jones, the Reverend Shonda Jones. She's a reverend now. And we would get together often and talk about different things that needed to change on campus. Well, one of the things that came to the surface was we didn't have MLK Day as a holiday, like a holiday that was on the school calendar that we could take off. Wait, wait, wait. 
Wait, one more time. I mean, just, just so to make sure yeah. the listeners heard you properly. Yes, in 1991 and two. <laughs> so so that was during not. our lifetime. Yeah. Okay. This is still the 90s. Right. Yeah. How many years from MLK? Ages, right? <laughs> uh, 30 years. We didn't have MLK Day off, and we thought it was odd. So we tried to come up with an idea to see if we could get it. And we tossed around several ideas and they just didn't seem like they would work. And one day I said, I know this is far-fetched, but I think that if we get their attention, we're going to have to get them in the pocketbook. And the one pocketbook I know about is over there at Eamon Carter. It's mm -hmm. the football team. And everybody looked at me like, what are you saying? I was like, what if they walked off the game? It was icy. Everybody was afraid. They were like, that's a, that's a little much. I was like, you know, if we get the right players, the ones that have decision-making power and leadership, maybe they consider it. So we had a bit of a struggle just meeting up with the fellas because, again, they were on a totally different schedule than we were. You know, when we were going to dinner, they were going to the training table somewhere else, and we never saw them, and then they go to, to practice. So we had to figure out how to, you know, get them to the BSC meeting. And somehow we did. There were two that came and they happened to be a couple of the leaders on the team. And I have to say, I give them credit for listening to us. But the minute we said, we want y'all to walk off on a Saturday at the game, they're like, oh, no, no, no. What are you talking about? Like, we could never. And so I said, OK, well, think about this. What if you walked off a of practice with the threat? And it could be a bluff to walk off on Saturday. And they said, well, and they walked over to a corner. They excused themselves. They had a whole conversation and they came back to us and they said, you know, this is really scary. Do you want us to talk to Coach Wacker? And we said, no, 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 don't talk to the coach. Just start walking. That's all you have to say, do. Don't say a word, just start walking. And the idea was they were going to walk from Amy Carter and they were going to walk past Moncrief. At the time, that was the first thing you would see right off of campus drive, right? Okay. Or stadium drive. Okay. Moncrief was right there. And back then, Frog Fountain was right in front of Brown Lupton, which was the student center. And it was the very center, of course, of the campus. And there was a crest in the way the land was was um, laid out where you would see tops of heads before you would see feet. And if they were gonna come over the hill, we would see the tops of their heads first. So the night came and I remember it was a Thursday night because Cosmic in a Different World had finished up their season. <laughs> so everybody had something, you know, a, a reason to come out and not miss the show. But we lined up the skiff and made sure that we had a photographer there, we had the, Black Student Caucus members, we had sorority fraternity members there, and anybody who wanted to support, and we waited, and we waited. And at first we thought, they probably chickened out. But soon enough, over the crest, over the horizon, the first head we saw was blonde and a little bit balding. And then we saw the players, and they were arm in arm, like they were gonna sing We Shall Overcome with Coach Wacker and they made it up the hill and boy, we were cheering, we were cheering. The skiff runs up, gets a picture and asked Coach Wacker, how did this happen? And he explained that the guys said that they had talked to the BSC and they had this idea, but they were afraid to not share it with him. And when they did, he said, I'm with you guys. Now, Coach Wacker didn't, he didn't win a lot of games, but he was a winner. And I understand that there were some adults that came behind us and did the behind the scenes negotiating to actually get it done. And the way it happened, the next MLK day that came that very same semester, we got it off. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Spectacular. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> when I see this and I got to tell you, when y'all played the video, I teared up again. Sylvia knows, Sylvain knows that I was really emotional. This was cathartic to be able to tell these stories because yeah. no one had asked us. Yeah. But the thing is, as you were telling the story, 
I received chills. I mean, the only thing missing from your narrative was like the crescendo classical music in the background, yes, right? I mean, yes, I mean, absolutely. This sounds amazing. It just sounds amazing. This is a true story. Yes, that's what happened. And, you know, I give credit to all of the Black students that were there during that time. I mean, I couldn't have just done that by myself. And I had to be able to bring up the idea and they had to be receptive. And we, you know, we gained some, some um, agreement around it. We aligned and we executed. And I look back at it and I have to ask the same question, Dr. G, what made us <laughs> stand up and speak out and have these, well, and it boldened us too. We, we had some other things on the agenda that we wanted well, see, to take care of. The thing is what you're saying that's so very powerful for all the students who are watching us in particular is you remind us of the power students have. Yes. See, now, in retrospect, in hindsight, it was, of course, the right thing to do. And if anything, mm -hmm. why didn't you do it sooner? But right. at that time, there was a lot of stake. Yes. There was risk involved. Mm -hmm. You had to overcome that apprehension and fear. And how did you do it? By bonding together. Yes, That's absolutely. the powerful message. And so students have more power and influence than maybe perhaps what they take for granted. And I think your story reminds us that students are not just beholden to whatever administrators say or faculty, the idea is that they are very much a part of the campus community and can influence the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things that we've seen with oral history, because I've heard that story from several different angles. Mm -hmm. um, definitely you have the gift of storytelling, <laughs> but I've heard different testimonies uh, from different angles. And every time what comes up is that several attempts to make change on campus have occurred throughout mm -hmm. TCU's history. But what was different about this one is that it came from just about all levels yes. of the administration of student life. Um, and nothing really of that size, of that magnitude has really happened since then, not as not with a, as quick a turnout. Sure. Let's put it that way. And, um, the different people I've interviewed, including you, have said at the end, you know, we made it happen, but it took so many of us. Yes. And it was exhausting. Yes, absolutely. But you know what? That was a lesson that I took into corporate America. Hmm. We call it stakeholdering. <laughs> you get everyone aligned and you, you meet before the meeting mm. and you get everyone on board so that when the actual meeting happens, there's a good chance that it will come off the way you want it to. And so these are the lessons I learned at TCU. Mm -hmm. But you teach at TCU now. So yeah. how do today's students reflect on those needed changes? Well, you know, it's interesting because I only pepper those scenarios in every once in a while. And I believe it was fall of 2022, the senior seminar class. Um, they they were going to have MLK Day off. Everybody knew it was coming. It's on the syllabus, right? We're going to skip it. And at some point I said, you know, let me tell you a story about how that came to be. Hmm. And I shared the story with them. A predominantly white class, a couple of black students, a couple of Hispanic, maybe um, international students that were there. But they were a little taken aback that their professor had something to do with it. History so coming to life. Time been having fun. I, I was just wondering whether is now a good time to bring in our final guest, uh, just to make sure he doesn't miss the party here? Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. G. And so our third <laughs> guest. A little technical problems there. Uh, so our third guest is uh, Tony Leon Reed Jr. After serving for seven years, in the Marine Corps, Leon Reed studied political science at TCU and graduated in 1999. At TCU, he was involved in numerous student organizations, including the Hyper Frogs and the SGA's Student Consent Committee. Leon graduated from Texas Tech School of Law in 2003, and he runs his own Fort Worth law practice, the law office of Leon Reed Jr. He has been voted a Fort Worth top attorney numerous times. He has 
been serving as a defense attorney for the Tarrant County Veterans Treatment Court since its inception in 2010. Leon is service-minded. He ran for the Fort Worth Judicial Court in 2014. And in 2020, he helped found Work for Freedom, a group of work for, yeah, work for reform, sorry, a group of attorneys committed to improving police and community relations. That year, he walked from Fort Worth to Austin in hopes of presenting his proposal for statewide police reform to the government. Leon, welcome and say hello to all of our viewers, wherever they are. Thank you, and and good evening to everyone. Uh, I hate bios. I start looking around for whomever the people are talking about when I hear stuff about me. Uh, so it's just, it's always humbling to hear um, kind of how far you've come, and I'm grateful for being here and grateful for being considered for this opportunity. Okay, thank you. And again, I would ask uh, Dr. G and Dr. Sylvian Greensward to take over from here and ask you questions. Absolutely, and one of the reasons why we wanted to go through your um, you know, prodigious biography is to distinguish you from just a generic description. Speaking of which, wouldn't you have a story to share about during the time you're at TCU about some sort of generic description? Why don't you like elaborate <laughs> as to like what happened with you and, and others around that time and what was the response? If you, Getting if you... right into it, huh, Dr. G? I'm, I'm yeah. just saying, time is at the essence. <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, during the time period that, that, that I was a student on the campus from 94 to 99, it took me that fifth year, um, uh, there was um, a person who was, there was a serial rapist that was going around the campus. Uh, or in the TCU area, not necessarily uh, the campus proper, but in the peripheries around the campus, uh, enough that the, the TCU student body uh, should have been concerned. And um, the police department put out a description that basically covered, you know, three quarters of the black men on the campus, uh, you know, age uh, 19 to 24, uh, five foot, you know, eight to six foot, you know, two uh, slim bill, you know. And um, so as a result of that, what ended up happening was um, really the police department start trying to, to, to catalog all of the black males. And so you'd, you know, you'd hear about people just getting randomly stopped uh, at on or around campus. And I remember one night in particular, I got stopped. Uh, walking to the Albertsons that is across the street, uh, across Barry from the university. Um, and a police officer stopped me and he filled out what they call a field interrogation card. Just got my contact information and all of that. I'm like, why are you stopping me? Did I do something wrong? It was like, no, just want to, you know, you know, you know, find out what's going on. So a couple of days later, it was a Monday night because I was watching Monday Night Football. Um, I got a call from a police detective that was in the area and he said he wanted me to come clear my name. Uh, I said, clear my name of what? <laughs> because I hadn't done anything. And uh, so he said, you know, we want, we're just trying to clear people off of our list of, of potential, you know, rape suspects. So I knew that I had nothing to do with that, of course, but I went down because I was kind of curious uh, as to how that, that, that interview process would be. And, Quite frankly, he, he, he said I was the spitting image of the description. And again, they didn't know what this person, you know, looked like. I just, I guess, you know, that that swath of a description, it, you know, I fell right in it. And he'd asked me if I'd raped anyone. Uh, and I was like, come on, dude, you know. And then he asked for a DNA sample to clear my name. And understand that at the time, they weren't just running the DNA samples against items that they found in particular locations and, and clearing your name. Uh, once you gave your DNA sample, it stayed in a database, in a police database, and your name and your DNA would you know, be run against anybody now, henceforth, and forevermore. Uh, and they weren't telling people that part. And we actually had someone had actually sued the police department to get their DNA removed. But 
that was an interesting time period, you know, because that was just one of those periods in time where if you were a black male on the campus, then you were suspect. Well, you fit the profile of an attorney to me personally. Right. But, you know, um, I really appreciate you sharing that story from the 1970s. You said it was the 70s. Oh, no. Quit playing with me. I ain't that old. That was I was on the yard from 94 to 99. Oh, oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. It just sounded as if it was like a story from the 70s. Ah, it said January 22nd of 1999. Yeah. Oh, well, excuse might be excused. So here's the deal. I know Dr. Greenstone wants to ask you another question, um, but I just wanted to let the listeners and viewers know that if you're interested in hearing more about Leon Reed's story, El Michelle and others, that as a result of this oral history, we were able to produce an actual book along with Mr. Perkins that will be coming out relatively soon. It's called um, uh, History to, Me to Remember, TCU History in Purple, White, and Black. So if you're interested and you find this stimulating, the good news is there is more to explore. Yes. And if I may, uh, according to what you documented in this oral history project, by the way, nice to see you again, my brother. Um, you mentioned a discussion in which you convinced a fraternity to actually stop printing shirt with a Confederate flag on it. Yes. How did these discussions go? Can you share with the audience how this went about? Well, one, uh, a fraternity, you know, they, they had a t-shirt made, um, which, you know, it's customary for different parties, these kind of things. Um, they they had a T-shirt made and it had, you know, Texas Christian University and stuff on the front and on the back. It uh, it said, you know, uh, Southern by birth. Then it had a big Confederate flag and underneath it, it had their fraternity by the grace of God. And, you know, of course, um, you know, being a black male, I'm like, dude, you know, I don't care if an individual wears a shirt with a Southern flag, but when it has the Texas Christian University logo on it that I'm paying for, that's where I have a problem. So I did bring it to the attention of, of you know, the, the dean of campus life at that point. But I said, before you do anything, I would like the opportunity to speak with the leaders of the fraternity, um, you know, just just to speak with them, because sometimes people don't know what they don't know. And they were open to speaking. And, and we all it was interesting. We met uh, in the dean's office at a little square table and sat down and all of us had a corner and we chopped it up and, and we kind of let them know, like, hey, here's what all of this. Here's what this flag is tied to. Um, you can't take the symbolism from a symbol. And while you may think it means and what they intended it to mean was, you know, uh, pride and being from the South and so forth. I was like, well, there's a flip side to that. And that is that in any race based organization or hate group, terroristic group like the Klan, uh, they always have that Confederate flag as one of their symbols. Mm -hmm. And you're tying your organization and yourself to that flag and, and to that history, um, the murders that were committed in that white hood and by other and other acts of violence, you know, that were committed with that flag being prevalent. And the students themselves said, you know, that ain't that isn't what we're about. Um, they were gracious. They were like, look, we'll get rid of that shirt. And because that's not what our fraternity is about. And they were more inclined to getting along and, and having light shed in that moment than so they, they put relationships above that T-shirt because, you know, that was something that that was special. And at the end of the day, uh, the university didn't have to get involved. Uh, you know, they facilitated and the students ourselves said, you know, we have more pride in being horn frogs and and going out and beating other schools in the conference and and getting along than than having this t-shirt and being tied uh, to that imagery. And so that was a real special moment um, during my tenure at TCU. And I like to also say that that when the Million Man March came up, you know, a group of us asked TCU, "Hey, can you send us? Can we go? Can you?" And TCU 
sent, you know, a small group of us. We asked if TCU would pay for us to go, and the school did. And they said, you know, come back, share your experiences with us. Let us know what it was about. So um, TCU, I found, while there were, there were difficult times for sure, uh, if because of the people who were on the campus in leadership positions on campus, Don Mills, uh, Cornell West, Phyllis Bodie, uh, Darren Turner, um, uh, you know, uh, Barbara Herman, you know, uh, Kay, all of those, you know, those people had enough wherewithal to do, if it was the right thing to do, then they were about doing the right thing. Yeah, and several of the people you mentioned uh, have been or will be interviewed as part of this oral history project. Uh, if anybody is interested in seeing those videos, the raw videos, uh, they are available currently on uh, the TCU Libraries um, digital repository website, then I believe the link is posted right now. Thank you so much, Dr. G and Dr. Greensward. Now we'd like to bring uh, L. Michelle Smith. So we have all of us. Um, on the screen, and we would like to, we've been reading some comments, we would welcome um, audience questions at this time. So fire away, and uh, our guest um, happy participants are happy to answer those questions, and we'll be, uh, we'll get to them as quickly as we can. And while we're waiting for a potential question, I just saw that a post was put in the comment section. If you are interested and wish to participate or support the idea of race and reconciliation, you can do so by buying some gear. And so uh, in addition to t-shirts, from coffee mugs to sweatshirts, there are all types of ways in which you can express your support uh, for the cause of race and reconciliation. Again, it's about creating that space and place to continue to talk about race. Yes, and they're available in our bookstore. And, and also the podcast, Reconcile This, a, a very engaging podcast, which was co-founded by yourself, Dr. G, and uh, co-hosted by you as well. So the podcast, the interview, um, important folks who have uh, stories to tell about uh, race and reconciliation, a very, very uh, engaging program. So we encourage you to listen to the podcast, um, check us out, follow us on social media, certainly buy the gear. We, we're all for that. Yes. Okay. The questions coming up. Can we read any of the questions? Can we see any of the questions or comments? This. Someone is asking, what is the biggest way TCU has changed? They're asking that question to both of our guests. Well, Michelle, I'll d defer to you. <laughs> well, I think one of the ways that it's changed is that it's even having this conversation and this work that's being done. One of the questions you asked me about, Dr. Greensward, was, was there anyone to turn to when we were on campus? And if we were to turn to someone, what, what would they do? And the answer really was no one. We we didn't have anybody to talk to when things happened, like uh, Leon described. We, we just didn't. And if there was someone we could speak to, they didn't have the heft or the power in, in order to console us, raise it, whatever might have been done back then. So the other thing is that you have a whole office of DE&I that wasn't there, that, that wasn't there. <laughs> So that's, that's one of the major changes. I, I do know that the numbers have increased. I was the only one online. Should I say online? I, um, yeah, it was intake for Alpha Kappa Alpha. Just one of me. And there were five of us on campus for Alpha Kappa Alpha. Now you've got a good yard of Kappa Lambda. So that's good. And some of the other sororities and fraternities have good numbers. Um, but there's a there's a long way to go. Well, yeah, and I I would not like to add when I was on the campus and it was uh, one of those things that I don't, you know where in the football stadium there was like the black section and it was just de facto it wasn't anybody's rule there was no line or nothing but the south end of the end zone that last section that's where if you went to a football game. That's where all the black folk hung out. That's where all the black folk. And I, there was nothing written. 
it's just where we where we went and that's where you know I guess like when you're the the you know the Cheerios in a bowl I don't know how it works but they all end up sucking up next to each other and <laughs> and, and so we were in the stadium or even in the cafeteria right by the glass window uh you know that's where we were and 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 so I'm glad that that when I look over and I see the student body at a game um you know that 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 section isn't there uh you know and and you, you see you know just uh, a, a, a more willingness that everybody's just glad to be in the moment and being a TCU student together uh, and just having the feeling that uh, you know during my tenure on the campus hopefully I played some small part in that uh, because we are I think everyone on here is a bridge builder we don't want anything negative in our life to have to be transferred to who's coming behind us if we can fix it uh, we fix it in the moment so that the you know the path is easier for those coming behind us and so in that frame of mind, I, again, I thank y'all and I give y'all y'all's accolades and praise in that. Yeah, I'm getting signals that uh, uh, we should be wrapping up. But of course, this uh, event uh, will be available for, for folks to uh, log on and view again. And I want to thank you all so very much. First, I want to thank all of the, the panelists, L. Michelle Smith, Attorney Leon Reed, Dr. Sylvian Greensward, Dr. G, and so many others who you do not see who have been working behind the scenes to make this as flawless as possible. We thank you. And we want to say a special thank you to all of our viewers, wherever you are, from Horn for Country, Thank you very, very much. Thanks to all of, all of you for joining us this evening to hear about TCU history directly from the folks who have lived it. And we invite you to participate in the very many offerings of the Race and Reconciliation Initiative. Dr. G had mentioned them. Find out more at rri.tcu.edu. And we hope you'll be able to join us on campus on April 19 for the 2023 Reconciliation Day. And also keep an eye out for Fall TCU Magazine, the special 150th edition, which will contain a fascinating story about the initiative and about Charlie and Kate Thorpe, a black couple whose contributions helped launch TCU back in the 1800s. We hope they would be proud to see our work to keep telling the truth about our history today. Thank you to all of you in attendance again for joining us tonight as we discuss the Race and Reconciliation Initiative and our oral history project. Again, special thanks to Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., AKA Dr. G, Dr. Sylvian Greensward, Dr. Mark Wasnick who couldn't join us this evening, L. Michelle Smith, Mr. Attorney Leon Reed, and our partners, TCU Magazine, the Alumni Association, and the Office of Social Media Management. Stay in touch with the TCU Alumni Association at alumni.tcu.edu and on Horn Frog Connect. Thank you for joining us and go frogs.